Cymatics, it's a subset of vibrational phenomena where sound creates different patterns in plates of sand or liquid. You might have seen examples such as the Chinese sprouting ball or what we're gonna create in this video, a clatney plate. Or is it clatney or chladney? Uh, I don't know. I've seen people make it in simulation notes, but today we're gonna just use regular geometry notes. So yeah, if this sounds interesting to you, consider liking the video, it really helps me out. You can also just skip the tutorial and get the dedicated note group for this system. Uh, the link is in the description. So let's get started. We're gonna add a plane. Uh, and we're gonna go over into our geometry notes editor and add a new group. So the very first thing we have to implement is the math that gets us the correct shape. Now, before you click off the video, here's the equation. It looks very scary, uh, but we're gonna break it down into notes and actually it's quite simple. So we have a few variables in our equation here, namely X and Y, these are our position coordinates. Then we have L, L represents the length of the plate itself. And then we have two variables, N and M. And we're gonna use these to create different patterns. But of course we have to first write this whole equation using nodes. I'm gonna walk you through that. So we're gonna start off with our X and Y value, which is our position. So let's get a position node. Uh, and we're gonna also get a separate X, Y, Z node so we can get both the X and the Y separate. So what is the first thing we have to do? Well, let's tackle this section in between this cosine here, which says n times pi times x divided by l. We're gonna recreate this equation, but using math nodes. So let's get a math node and set it to multiply. Uh, and let's first multiply x with pi. So we all know pi, it's a constant 3.1415, etc. We can just type it in into our nodes and we will get it. Next, we have to multiply by our variable n. Uh, to get a new variable, uh, we're going to use one of the group inputs. Uh, so let's duplicate this multiply node, connect one of our group inputs to one of the value sockets, and let's connect our other result we have here uh, to the second value socket. So now we have this bit, n times pi times x. Let's divide it, so let's get another math node and set it to divide. We're going to divide it by l, which is a new variable. So let's again get it from our group input, connect it to the socket over here, and connect those two nodes up. Now that we have this equation in between these brackets, uh, we have to take the cosine from this, which is actually very easy. We just get another math node and set it to cosine uh, and connect our last value to the input socket. Actually, let's go ahead and name these variables we've created. Uh, the first one was n and the second one was l. There we go. We've just completed the first part of the equation, which is the cosine of x times pi times n divided by l. Still with me? Good, okay, because the next part is actually very easy because it's basically the same equation, but a few of the inputs are changed. As you can see, it looks very similar. This time it's the cosine of m times pi times y divided by the length, which is L. So we basically use these same four nodes, uh, but instead of connecting the x to the first multiply node, we connect the y to the first multiply node. And instead of connecting n to the second multiply node, we actually connect m. So let's get a new value over here at our group input and connect that to our second multiply node. And we're gonna name this value M. Lastly, we connect our L value just like before to the divide node. Now, if you look at the second half of the equation, you will see that it's exactly the same as the first half, except for one thing. N and M have switched places. So it's basically the same eight nodes. We're gonna duplicate them. Um, and let's connect them up like before. We're gonna connect X and Y to the first two multiply nodes over here. So in the first row, we have N connected to the second node. And in the second row, we have M connected to the second row. We wanna switch that around. So let's connect N to the last row. So the second multiply node of the last row. And we're gonna connect M to the third row. And then again to the second node of that third row. And finally, we wanna connect L to the divide node just like before, let's do that right here. Uh, and actually, I'm gonna to go to the group input and switch uh, these around, so L is at the bottom. Makes it a little more easy to see. So we now have these four outputs, so what do we do with them? Let's go back to the equation. We see that the first two cosines are multiplied with each other, and then the last two cosines are also multiplied with each other. So let's do that first. Uh, let's duplicate this math node and set it to multiply and connect both of these values. And we're gonna do the exact same for the two cosines uh, down here. So we're gonna connect those two up. So now we have the first half of the equation and here we have the second half. 
What is happening to those two halves? Well, let's look at the equation. Uh, the second half gets subtracted from the first half. So we can do that with math notes. I'm going to duplicate it, uh, set it to subtract, and we're going to subtract the second half from the first half, just like that. So we just did a whole lot and we're not seeing anything yet. Uh, so let's actually create a viewer node uh, and we're going to connect uh, the value up with our viewer node over here and connect the geometry as well. And let's see how that looks. Surprised, we actually don't see anything yet. Uh, that's because of two reasons. The first reason is we have no resolution basically on the plane. Um, to fix that, let's go into edit mode uh, and let's just subdivide this plane a whole lot of times. So let's subdivide it like 100 times. Uh, secondly, we haven't actually set any variables yet. So let's go over into our modifier menu. Um, I'm gonna go out of edit mode because otherwise we can't see it. Uh, and let's set the length to one. Uh, and then we're gonna pull up these values. I'm gonna set N to one. I'm gonna set M to five. Uh, and here we go. We already have some interesting patterns over here. So the equation actually gives us the zero point of these lines where the sand goes as the plate is being vibrated. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that if we get a compare node um, and set it to equal, uh, and set it to equal to zero and then pull up the epsilon over here, uh, we can actually get the desired pattern uh, already. We could subdivide the plane to actually get more resolution on this. So maybe something like that. And you can get some very interesting patterns already. You could also instead get a math node and set that to absolute. This will set the negative value to positive values. And you see we get black lines. Uh, we could actually invert this by getting a subtract node uh, and subtracting our result from one. Uh, so let's do that right now, connect that up, see how that looks. Yeah, there we go. So the next part is going to be distributing our sand onto the plate uh, and actually getting the animation that it goes to the lines. So for us to know where the sand actually has to move, we have to create uh, some sort of normal map. And I want to take a moment to shout out the creator Chris Bettini. Uh, they actually created a simulation node set up for this and they have a really clever way of getting those normal. So definitely go to their channel, check out their video. Uh, Chris Bettini, they only have 3000 subscribers, so give them some love and watch their videos. I think they're really good. What we're gonna do is take our original geometry and get a set position node and just put it right here. And then we're gonna get a combine XYZ node and we're gonna get the value from our subtract node over here and connect that to the Z input of the combine XYZ node. If we now connect this vector to our offset, you will see what happens. Yeah, so it creates this very intense effect of these waves. Uh, you could get a vector math node uh, and just multiply it down so it's not as intense. I'm actually gonna get rid of the subtract node so it's not inverted. Uh, and then we have this shape. So I don't really care about the shape itself. I care about the normals. So the normals are which direction the faces are pointing in. And I want those normals to be pretty exaggerated basically. So I'm actually gonna multiply this up a lot. Let's say 100. So right now the shape looks really bad and uh, we want to fix that. Uh, and we're going to fix that using a store named attribute node. Um, so let's get that node. And we're going to use this to set it back to the original position uh, while we still retain that normal data. So let's set the store named attribute to vector and let's give it a name. Let's give it original position, something like that. Connect it up over here before the set position node we have here. Uh, and then let's just get a position node uh, and connect that up. And now we're gonna store the normals that we've created over here. So let's get another store named attribute node uh, and let's set it to um, new normal, something like that. I'm terrible with getting names for these kind of things. Uh, let's get a normal node. So we actually store that attribute just like that. Uh, and now to actually get it back to the original position, we get another set position node and we're gonna use this attribute over here. So let's get an attribute node, a named attribute. Uh, and it was original position. And we're gonna connect this attribute to the position input over here. And you can see that the plane returns back to normal. But what is really interesting is we can use this normal data we've created over here. So to visualize it, let's get a named attribute and set it to our new normal. Connect that to our viewer and you can see that on a flat surface, we still have this normal data, which is very useful for later. So the next part is actually distributing points and getting them to line up with the pattern we've created. I'll come back later to make this part of the video. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you have any suggestions for videos, leave them in the comments below because 
Uh, I'm just making what I like to see, but actually want to make what you like to see. So for instance, if you want to see something related to AI or something related to modifiers or constraints or just geometry node stuff, please let me know in the comments because I will make what you want to see. All right, you're back. So let's gather some points on this geometry. I'm gonna get rid of the named attribute for now uh, and get a distribute points on faces node. Let's set the density very high to like 1000. So we have a lot of points. We can also change the point radius to actually make it a little better. Um, so let's do that right now and set it to like 0 0.005 or that's too small, maybe 0 0.01. Yeah, that's better. This won't actually matter when you're instancing points, but it's a little easier to visualize. So we now have our scattered points, but we still have to move them to the pattern that we've created. And we do that using the normal that we've stored here. So our new normal attribute. And we can actually do this in two ways. We can use the normal map that we've just created, but we can also use the geometry proximity as default cube or CG matter used in his video. We're going to implement both. So we have two sliders because they look differently. And let's start by implementing the normal map. We're going to get a group input node so we can actually use some more variables. And next, let's get a math node and set this math node to multiply. Uh, and we're going to connect a new value, which is our first separation value to this math node. I'm going to name it separate one. And we're going to go back to the beginning of this cluster and get our absolute node over here and connect the value to our multiply node. Next, we will get a combine XYZ node. And we're going to connect the output of the multiply node to the X and the Y value. Next, we're going to use the normal attribute that we've stored. So let's get a named attribute node and set it to our normal that we've stored. Uh, next, we're going to get a vector math and just multiply the two. So let's do that. Set it to multiply and connect those two values. And we're going to use this output value to actually set the position of these points. Uh, so let's get a set position node. And we're going to plug this output to the offset input. And you can already see that something is happening. It's very intense now. Uh, if you pull the slider down, you will actually see what's going on. Uh, it actually follows the lines just like that. Uh, I'm actually gonna disconnect this from the viewer so it's a little easier to see. Yeah, so we can play with this slider. It works in between zero and 0 0.1 kinda. Uh, and then it kind of overshoots like that. Uh, so if we zoom in here, uh, this is when it's zero. And the lines go along like this, uh, like we can see when we actually have it connected like that. So yeah, zero lines go like that and it actually moves out in the correct direction until it hits the line, but it keeps on traveling further. Nevertheless, it still looks pretty natural, uh, which is very good for our case. So that's why I wanted to show you this implementation. We're now going to make the second method of separating it into these lines. Let's go back to our math over here and we're going to use the output of this subtract node over here. Um, let's actually get a compare node uh, and set this compare node uh, to equal or actually we're going to set it to not equal uh, and let's connect this subtract value to our a value. And let's actually steal our viewer node from over here uh, and connect it up over here. Uh, connect the geometry and connect the result of the not equal node to the value. And you will see uh, the kind of shape we get. We get the pattern that we used to have, but the pattern itself is actually black and the empty areas are actually white. Now, why do we need this? We're going to use this to actually delete geometry from this plane. So let's get a delete geometry node and uh, we're going to put it right after our fork here. Now, plugging the result from our not equal node to the selection, uh, you will see that we are left with only the black part. So only the pattern itself. And we're going to use this geometry to move the points that are not inside the pattern. So the ones over here, for instance, uh, to the closest part of the pattern. We do that by getting a geometry proximity node. And we're going to put it right after the delete geometry node. And we can use this position output to actually set the position of all the points. Uh, so let's do that. Let's get a second set position node, connect our geometry from down here to the geometry. Uh, and use this position output and connect that to the position input of the set position node. So let's get our viewer node to actually see what's going on. Uh, and we see that it follows the lines quite nicely. This is pretty good, but we don't have a slider now like we have over here. Uh, so how do we make that? Uh, it's actually very simple. We're just going to get a position node, a regular position node. And now we have the original position over here and the new position over here. And we're going to use a mix node to actually interpolate in between those. So let's set the mix node to vector. 
connect our position to the A output and our second position here to the B output. And finally, we're gonna connect the result to the set position node. If we now use the factor, actually let's set the separate one to zero so we can see it a little better. Yeah, if we use the factor, we can now see that it goes right along to the pattern. Uh, and this one looks a little more crisp. Like it has a different feel to it than this one. And that's why I wanted to show them both. We can make a new variable and plug it into the factor of the mix node. So we actually have a slider for that as well. I'm gonna call it separate two. And yeah, you can just play around with these two sliders to get the effect that you want. So to finalize this result and really make everything come together, we will add a noise texture to create some random movements with these particles. So we're gonna get yet another set position node and put it right after the last one. And we're also gonna add a noise texture. Since we are moving the particles in the XY field, they could have random movement in the positive X axis, for instance, but they could also have movement in the negative X axis. At least that's what we want. Now noise textures, they always go from zero to one. So we have to map them to go from minus one to one. We do that using a map range node. So let's get that. Uh, and we're gonna set it to vector. And uh, we can just plug the color into our vector over here. It's the same, it's three numbers. So let's connect the color to our vector input. And we're gonna go down to the two min value. This is the original from zero to one and we wanna make it so it goes from minus one to one. Also, we don't want any movement in the Z axis. So let's get a vector math node and set it to multiply. Uh, and we're gonna multiply by one on the X and Y axis and zero on the Z axis. Let's plug that in uh, and let's create some room over here and plug the resulting vector into our offset. There we go, it's looking very, very noisy and we've lost the pattern that we've just created. That's because the noise texture is very intense at the moment. We can use this same multiply node and just pull down these two values to something that we like. There's one thing, however, that I don't like about this noise texture. When I set it to 4D and start playing with the W, um, it looks almost like water. It doesn't really look like every grain of sand has a random motion, it just looks like a noise texture. And I want it to look more noisy, more random. Um, so how do we do that? Well, there's actually a very clever way to do this. We can do this using the index node. And we're gonna plug it into our W value. So what will this do? Uh, well, I'll show you. Uh, the W value, of course, sets the phase of our noise. So the noise can transform smoothly over time. You use the phase for that, which is the W. And the index, of course, counts every point from zero to one, two, three, four. There are a thousand in here, so it will count to a thousand. Every point has its own individual value. Uh, and so every point is on a different phase of this noise texture. If we now introduce another math node and set it to add, we can still move the phase like we used to, but now you will see that it has a very different effect. And another fun thing is you can add another math node and set it to multiply and actually make it more and less random. Uh, so if we set this to, let's say 100, like a really high number, they will definitely not look like each other. Like every point will have a mind of its own. So scaling the noise texture down to 0.2, and setting the multiplying value to something very low, like 0.1. And then using the add value, you will see the kind of effect that we're getting here. It's less random than before. So this is it when it's very high. It's very random. And if we set it to 0.1, it's a little less random. So yeah, you can make some interesting effects using this little trick. So yeah, basically that's it. You can now use an instance on points node uh, and instance whatever you like. I'm gonna instance this UV sphere. Let's like make it a little easier to handle. Let's set this to 16 and set the rings to eight. Uh, I'm gonna connect the mesh to our instance. Uh, there we go, it's now very, very big. Uh, I'm gonna set the radius to 0.01 maybe. There we go, that's already looking better. And we can also play with the scale. So let's get a random value, maybe between 0.01 and 0.5 uh, and connect this value to our scale. There we go. And yeah, you can give it the initial random movement by using this node over here. Uh, you can also plug that into your group input if you want another variable for that. Uh, let's call it the noise value. And while we're at it, let's connect one to the multiply node as well, which is, I guess, our noise multiplier. I don't really know what to call it. I'm just gonna call it the noise multiplier. 
I hope you learned something during this tutorial. I definitely did while making this. If you did consider liking the video or leaving a comment, it really does help the video out in the algorithm so more people get to see it. I also want to thank everyone so much for 10,000 subscribers. It's really crazy that we've hit it so fast. I've had this channel for over 10 years actually. You can see most of my old videos. I have never seen the growth that we have achieved in the last few months. So yeah, keep watching, keep noting, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.